Yeah, thank you, Sister Diane. Um, thank you, Father Dan, for the invitation. Uh, Sister Diane for the communications since then and, and the follow-up and the, and the nice introduction here. So, yeah, just briefly, I'm, I'm Father Harchi, Father Mike Harchi. I've um, been a priest in the diocese for uh, almost, seven year now, almost seven years now. May will be seven years. Um, yeah, I grew up in uh, St. Matthew Parish on the east side, so in Gahanna over there. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. And, um, and now I'm working at the, the Chancery Office after the first five years of my priesthood being in, in parishes. Um, so now I'm working kind of full-time doing some more just kind of diocesan administration stuff and uh, really focused on the, the Real Presence, Real Future initiative uh, that we're doing, the kind of the future planning initiative for our, our diocese. And along with that, uh, something that, that was uh, passed on to me right before Bishop Brennan left was the Synod on Synodality. So just helping to organize that. We had some deanery synod sessions last weekend. We'll have the rest of the deanery synod sessions uh, this coming up weekend. So maybe you've seen that in the, in the Catholic Times or, or heard about that a kind of worldwide initiative. So, um, Well, good. So I didn't want to just take the, the time to, to list all the ways that we might hear the, the cry of the, the poor and the, and the vulnerable the way that it's uh, covered up in our lives. So uh, to me, maybe that's a little bit too, um, too detached from, from our real life. And, and just like kind of hearing about that doesn't really challenge us in the way that, that the gospel often wants to, to, to challenge us in order to grow and in order to, to be able to maybe be a little bit more attentive to their cry. So um, that's a little bit more of what this, this reflection or talk or whatever is going gonna, is gonna to point to. Just maybe a little bit of a challenge for us in this Lenten season. Uh, Fratelli Tutti was our Holy Father's most recent encyclical, and he took that title from the way St. Francis of Assisi addressed his, his brothers. You know, we are all, all brothers. And now our Holy Father uses it to address us all as, as brothers and, and sisters, and helping us to recognize, this, uh, recognize one another as having uh, this inherent dignity in our, our humanity. So this may be easy for us to accept this uh, principle of Catholic thought and action that we are all brothers and sisters in the human family, and then have a greater bond with those who share uh, the gift of, of baptism as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, it may be easy to live out when we see and hear those who are like us, and it may be easy to live out this uh, brotherhood uh, when we see and hear things, uh, those who, who, who appear to need our help. It may be easy to accept that we're all brothers and sisters when we get to determine the parameters for our actions and for our response, is accepting all of, as brothers and sisters and opening ourselves up to the cry of the poor and the vulnerable just as easy to live out when you and I have to reflect on um, our own lives and eva evaluate the standards by which we live? Is it just as easy? As we consider who we respond to in the, the poor and the vulnerable, we ask ourselves in seeking to hear others and respond to others, who am I aiming to please? Am I aiming to please others? Am I aiming to please myself? Or am I aiming to please God? What's my motivation? Anyone can seek out and assist the poor and the vulnerable. It's our duty as Catholics not only to, to seek out and respond to the cry of the poor and the vulnerable, um, but those who are, uh, who are not uh, Catholic, those who are not Christian, um, can do this just as well as us, uh, just as, as cheerfully and just as readily. But for us as, as Catholics, for us as Christians, uh, we first seek the face of God and the voice of God. And unless we do this, we won't be able to properly hear those who are poor and vulnerable. Instead, we'll be seeking a solution that we have determined that they need, rather than really hearing their cry for actually what they truly lack. So then I invite us to, as, as Christians, reflect on, is it our main goal to please uh, God first by serving others? When we seek uh, God's face first, we're able to see the needs of others more genuinely and selflessly. And such people work in the presence of God and have no interest in whether anyone else notices, um, notices their actions or their good deeds. When again, we're seeking the, the face of God first. So take this uh, following little anecdote from, from somebody who is a, a faithful Catholic and a, a, a sort of a, a business leader. 
he recounted, uh, I was once invited to address a conference on educational reform in St. Petersburg, Russia. Although it was a frigid morning, I had considered not wearing my winter coat because the lining had been badly torn when it got caught in a revolving door the previous day. But it was cold, so I wore it anyway. I arrived at the conference hall, handed my coat to an elderly lady at the coat check counter, and ascended the staircase to the conference room. When the event ended, the same elderly lady brought me my coat. I thanked her, went to dinner, and eventually arrived back at my hotel. Removing my coat, I was astonished to notice that its lining had been exquisitely repaired. It was the work of the elderly lady at the coat check counter. She was not an employee of a major corporation with a mission statement talking about the firm's dedication to uncompromising personal service, but rather of a state enterprise that had no interest in service of any kind and paid paltry wages. The beauty of her work moved me. She did her, uh, so did her selflessness, her concern for me, a, personal, a complete stranger, and her desire to pass unnoticed. She received no recognition and no thanks for me because she didn't tell me what she had done. She did what she did, as the Russians would say, before the face of God. In order to get to that place where we want to do things for others only before the face of God, we should examine our lives and consider carefully whether we're embracing uh, gospel simplicity and so that we are indeed in a position to, to notice and to hear uh, what the poor and the vulnerable are, are saying. Uh, the saints in the history of the church have, have done this. They've lived this and, and responded in this way. They've embraced uh, the gospel and all its radical principles. The gospel leads them and us to that place, of doing things just before the face of God. We also do well to hear about others who have uh, lived out the simplicity of life in order to better please God as we seek to serve our neighbor. Thomas DeBay is a, a widely respected uh, teacher and, and retreat master and priest, and, um, and he writes about how gospel, radical gospel simplicity uh, really is and how radically it can really be, be lived out. Uh, and it's his contention that it's not an exaggeration to live out this, this gospel simplicity but it can and, and should be lived up by all, no matter our, our state in life. Gospel simplicity uh, calls us to a radical new way of living for Christ and serving the poor and the vulnerable. So Father DeBay found many examples of this lifestyle of embracing gospel simplicity among the saints. They serve as tremendous examples for us uh, of people who have chosen to live heroically gospel-centered lives in their own day and time. This choice was transformative for them and for the people around them. They made this choice not to please others. Uh, in fact, when we live gospel simplicity, we're um, oftentimes like displeasing uh, to others. We, we're, we're convicting uh, in a sense. But they made this choice not to please others, but, but to please God, so that in, in doing that, they were more, they opened themselves up more and more to, to, to see and hear the, the cry of the, the poor and, and the vulnerable and respond to it more effectively. So Father DeVay offers some examples. Uh, Charles de Foucauld uh, said to his married sister, yes, live simply, avoid any unnecessary expense in your manner and way of life, withdraw even further from anything that smacks of the world of vanity and pride. There must be no economizing on good books, the spiritual lives of, uh, the, of the saints, uh, so it's good for us at a university. Uh, no economizing on alms, no reduction here, but rather increases. Trust, trust. Father goes on to say, the deeply converted uh, layperson is radically different from his counterparts. He's a challenge in the flesh. In the New Testament outlook, people so love one another that they wish their material goods to be used by others rather than themselves. He recognizes that lay people can even derive great insights uh, from the way that priests and religious live their lives. Yes, they're different, but it's beside the point that 12 men transform the world without a course on methods and without any wealth to speak of. Preparation for the priesthood, said Pope St. Pius VI, as another example from, from Father Dubay, uh, requires a demanding asceticism, which, however, is not suffocating. 
A priest must practice self-denial in the highest degree, for it is an essential condition for following Christ. Celibacy is connected with personal asceticism. Priestly life, says the Holy Father, requires a truly virile asceticism, both interior and exterior. When he became bishop, St. Francis de Sales imposed on himself a rule of life which included stipulations bearing on frugality. He was not to wear silken robes, and yet his clothes were to be clean and suitably made. The food offered to his guests was to be frugal, and yet at the same time clean and properly served. Once he was appointed cardinal, indeed forced against his vigorous and persistent resistance, St. Robert Bellarmine was given by Pope Clement four sets of robes, purple and scarlet, which was three more, the recipient said, than the gospel allowed. Of these, he took such care that they lasted until his death, 22 years afterwards, the cuffs only having been renewed when the old ones were past all patching. The cardinal lived on bread and garlic, and he denied himself a fire throughout the chilly Roman wintertime. St. Robert, too, was of the mind that it was not his business to judge whether somebody was deserving of help, and his charity was of the authentic kind that thinks no evil, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He was imposed upon and cheated again and again, but he had a fixed principle that it was better to be deceived a hundred times than to miss one genuine case. And furthermore, not from Father's book, but, uh, but Pope Francis has remarked recently that it's our obligation to help those who are poor, and if those who um, we help are, are really um, not in need or seek it under false pretenses or misuse our charity, they're the ones who are answerable for that. We must do our part to respond to requests for, for need. So Lent is a good time for us to reflect upon the, the motives of our actions and to examine interiorly just who are we trying to please. We're in the desert for 40 days, and the desert can be a dangerous place. It's here where we're faced with our true selves. We're fasting, we're praying, we're giving alms. We're giving up those creature comforts that we've become so accustomed to uh, that, so that we can see who we re really are without that veneer of those comforts, those things that we think we can't live without time and time again throughout the year. And these actions that we undertake are meant to lead us uh, to a conversion of heart, as, as Sister kind of mentioned uh, just, just before this, to, to kind of take this time in Lent to change our minds about how we do things and about what motivates us. These penitential practices, they do open us up to hear uh, the cry of the poor and the vulnerable and, and get us closer to, to them because these interior penances, this fasting, this almsgiving, this extra prayers that we do, uh, brings us closer to God so that we're more receptive to the needs of others. So as we reflect on uh, hearing the, responding to the, the cry of the poor and the vulnerable, we acknowledge that um, for all those reasons that, that these, these comforts and things like kind of like uh, get in the way, we don't always hear their cry. We don't always see them. Uh, and the poor and the vulnerable are, are those who are unborn, those who are threatened with abortion, the elderly in nursing homes who are uh, discarded, all those vulnerable in between who are on the margins of society and find it equally difficult to be heard. And we see this uh, too, uh, kind of something unthinkable in, in Ukraine, people just being uh, a sovereign nation and, and, and being, being vulnerable. Uh, it could be the lack of per personal asceticism and living out gospel simplicity that deafens our ears to the cry of the poor and the vulnerable and, and blinds us, unfortunately, to their plight. So Pope Francis, uh, again, highlights the, the throwaway culture that we live in in Fratelli Tutti when he states, uh, some parts of our human family, it appears, can be readily sacrificed for the sake of others uh, considered, um, who, consider, who would rather have a, a worthy, who are considered more worthy of a carefree existence. Ultimately, he says, persons are no longer seen as a paramount value to be cared for and respected, especially when they're poor and disabled, quote, not yet useful, like the unborn, or, quote, no longer needed, like the elderly. We have grown indifferent to all kinds of wastefulness, starting with the waste of food, which is deplorable to the extreme. 
So this is from Pope Francis, from Fratelli Tutti. And a certain amount of asceticism expected of, all, of Christians at, at, at all times, but in Lent we're focusing on this in a particular way. Again, opening ourselves up uh, so that um, we don't think uh, with the world about people being useful or, or needed or not, but possessing rather that inherent dignity, no matter what state in life, uh, that stage in life that they're in, and what they're able to contribute to society. So when he mentions the, the wastefulness in, in, the, in this, this throwaway culture, uh, waste of food and all that, we won't get into that. I don't want to steal Father Streitenberger's thunder for next week, whatever his, his topic might be. But um, we'll stay on this topic of, of personal asceticism and helping us to remain then in solidarity with the, the, the poor. So in speaking of solidarity, the, the compendium for the social doctrine for the church states, quoting John Paul II, that Jesus of Nazareth makes the connection between solidarity and charity shine brightly before all, illuminating the entire meaning of this connection. In the light of faith, solidarity seeks to go beyond itself, to take on the specifically uh, Christian dimensions of total gratuity, forgiveness, and reconciliation. One's neighbor is not then only a human being with his or her own rights and a fundamental equality with everyone else, but becomes the living image of God, uh, of uh, God, uh, the faith, and redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and placed under the permanent action of the Holy Spirit. One's neighbor must therefore be loved, even if an enemy, with the same love with which the Lord loves him or her. Even if, um, and, and for a person's uh, sake, one must be ready to, for sacrifice, even the ultimate one, to lay down one's life for one's brethren. So, it's a tall order for us, and... Um, and to get ready to lay down our lives for, for others takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of those small sacrifices. So all this has great consequences for how we treat others and uh, has consequences for like those choices that we make uh, in our own lives. So our charity and our hearing the cry of the poor and the vulnerable uh, must go beyond itself, even to those whom we might um, not want to, to readily provide assistance to. And this is very uh, challenging for us challenging for us to go beyond ourselves and to think about what do I need to change in my life to respond better to the, the needs of others. Uh, we should be inspired to action when we see and hear injustice, but how do we do this? And, uh, what, um, what impact do we have on the, the plight of the, the poor and the vulnerable? How can we alleviate that? How do we hear them better? How do we seek them out? Uh, finally, um, we have the, the synod that Pope Francis called for, which is uh, highlighting our need and especially the church's need to be active listeners of the lived experiences of, of, of people's lives and their journey with the church. So our Holy Father Pope Francis says that he wants this to be uh, a style that we adopt in this active listening and this journeying together. And the Synod documents remind us that everyone is the expert of his or her own experience and that should be listened to. So that's something that we're highlighting in these synod sessions and, and trying to accomplish with these uh, spiritual conversations. And in doing so, we're reminded that while these synod sessions will have an end, and each diocese will write a report about what they, they hear from, from people from, from you know, all the corners of the, the church, where we're hoping, that while the, the sessions themselves have an end, we'll write this report, we'll send it in to the USCCB, who then compiles their own report and sends it on, on to Rome, our Holy Father does want this to be a style for us to adopt, this, this active listening, engaging in some kind of spiritual uh, conversations and, and dialogue with, with one another. Our Diocesan Planning Initiative, Real Presence, Real Future, is also meant to be a synodal experience uh, of, of sorts, in which we share the current state of the diocese and some uh, proposed options for the future with all the parishioners and allow them to, to journey uh, with us together as one body of Christ, to comment on them, provide alternatives, and so we can seek together as, as one body of Christ a, a solution and a, and a path forward. So as we're in this diocesan initiative and we talk about what are the needs of the future of the diocese, structurally, parish mergers, and, and things like that, that that might be in the, in the future, uh, it's, it's something that we um, maybe caught, caught a lot of people by surprise, but... Um, we do need to kind of sit in this, in this current reality of where we are as a, as a church and kind of sit in our grief and our awareness that in many ways we've not lived up to the proclamation of, of the gospel and made disciples as we should have. Not lived as disciples, not given a compelling example. In many ways we've taken our faith for granted and 
uh, conform more to secular society than, than Jesus Christ. And we've compromised in, in many ways. And for that reason, we're in this sort of planning initiative, looking at our structures, and also trying to find out you know, ways, determine ways that we can better evangelize, better live that, that and shine that, that light of Christ to others. Uh, and the failures that, that we kind of experience then as a, as a church, um, they're shared, they're, they're multi-generational, and it's maybe God sending us a little bit of a, a, a message that he's allowed us to make our choices, um, and he's allowing us to see these effects, but there's always great hope in the church. She's, she's not uh, so limited like any other institution. There's not a limited uh, number of resources that, that the church has, especially when it comes to grace and, and the Holy Spirit, and certainly not a limited number of, of members. Uh, and so, too, for some of those reasons, maybe, of not living up to this, this real gospel call that, that we're all called to, in some ways, we could see uh, Catholics as even being part of the, the poor and the marginalized and the vulnerable in society. So the solution to what is ailing the church and to what is ailing the, the body of Christ is not more programming, but more fidelity to Christ. The solution to hearing the cry of the poor and the vulnerable is in imitating Jesus Christ uh, no matter where we find ourselves in our lives. To imitate more, him more closely and to serve him more closely according to our state and doing things just as the Russians would say before the face of God without anyone else noticing and at the same time letting our light in Christ shine brightly uh, before others. These types of actions before the face of God that are motivated only by love of God which move us uh, forward in that most important area that place where nobody knows better, uh, that personal conversion, that place where we are the, uh, the master and the expert of our own experience, a place of deep personal conversion. This is the solution to any crisis that we see in the church, and this is the solution to hearing and responding to the cry of the poor and the vulnerable. And with compassion, with solidarity, with a certain amount of simplicity, identifying with those, living like those uh, with whom we are expected to uh, to see and hear. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions or something, or is there? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I like that too. Yeah, and it wasn't me. It was that was from the Senate documents. That's really yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for highlighting that, that point about being an expert in our own, own experience. Because like, sometimes maybe we get yeah, really nervous and really overwhelmed. Like, what does this gospel simplicity look like? What am I really supposed to do? Like, I'm, not, I'm supposed to be like Robert Bellarmine and live on you know, bread and garlic or something. And we, uh, let's, we, yeah, we follow our conscience in, in the ways that, like, okay, this is, this is what I, I think I can do as a, as a Christian. And at the same time, then, trying to, to challenge ourselves, challenge that, that voice in our, our head. But, but, yeah, make sure that we're the expert of our own experience. We're, um, yeah, we're doing what we think is, is right to, re to respond to this. So thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, sister, yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I did, too. It was from uh, Alexander Havard. He's um, kind of like this, uh, like a, a, a businessman. Kind of, he, he studies kind of like leadership, and so he takes things from you know saints of the church, kind of from from different you know kind of secular people. But yeah, he wrote this really good book called uh, Virtuous Leadership, and that's where that little account came from about that that coat that got torn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that, 
and letting that be enough for us, that's hard too. It's like, who's going to thank me for this good thing that I just did, right? Who's going to see it? Like, God sees it, and that's enough, you know? But we yeah, should be for us, right? But it's true. We all want, uh, yeah, like, it's, yeah, yeah, we, we want that, the recognition. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. In the traditional message of the church. Right. You want to say yeah. what the synod really is. Many people may not know what the synod is. Many people are not of our faith. And so okay, yeah. So the synod on synodality, it's, it's, yeah, it's a way for really our, our synod is, is really what the way bishops kind of gather and, and, and help understand where the Holy Spirit is, is kind of leading them and, and speaking to the church and our, and our own kind of own day and time, not really to... It, to change, you know, doctrines or anything like that, but just kind of just res- respond best as a, as a church. So in this one we got coming up in 2023, Pope Francis wanted the whole church to kind of enter into dialogue with one another. So we're calling it the synod on, on synodality. So a synod on um, talking with the Holy Spirit and getting everyone kind of engaged in that. And so, yeah, it's, it's a huge challenge for every single diocese across the world. In the U.S., I've been going to these U.S. CCB meetings on, on Zoom, and there's a lot of dioceses who are doing uh, a lot of different things with a lot more resources and staff to, to kind of get to all these different areas. So some of them are asking their Catholic social services to have these little groups of people and asking their clients, like, how is the church journeying with you? And to that point of, like, people just not really understanding, some of the responses where they were sharing with us, like, well, you know, I don't really know. I, I go to the Catholic a food pantry on Monday, I go to the Lutheran place on, on Tuesday, and that's about all, you know, that's all I can really say right now. So, um, and uh, so different dioceses are kind of just, just kind of approaching it in different ways. And so since we've already done all these parish sessions for Real Presence, Real Future, which kind of helps us to kind of, you know, gain an understanding of where people are in the, in the, in the church and everything like that, we're doing one at each uh, deanery, and those have been going you know, pretty well so far. Over 400 people registered, which is not, not bad for, for stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways that we could, could have reached out to others and, and things like that. But, yeah. If I, if I, if I yeah, yeah ask, please. Yeah, really yeah. Um, uh, Sister Diane and Tommy and I went uh, a couple months ago to the ACCU. <coughs> Great. In this synod conversation uh, that's taking place around the world, because there was a concern that college students would not be able to participate. Mm-hmm. In this. this is happening back home, you know. So we do have a session here scheduled. Great. Uh, in, uh, do you have that date, sister? April 25th. April 25th. You, you should go get the date. Good. And you'll, you'll be hearing more about it. Good. Yeah, great, great. Put okay. Kind of three questions or three areas of questions. Yeah. So, um, so look for that information. Everybody in the university community will be invited to be part of it. That's great. And that's really crazy. I kind of wanted to mention something, but I didn't want to like... Yeah. Oh, ACCU is the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities. Good. I'm glad to hear you doing that. I was going to kind of, you know, maybe mention something... Uh, about that being possible, but not knowing, you know, what kind of you guys, uh, kind of things you guys do, but that's that's tremendous. I'm really glad to hear that. All right. Good. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, you're welcome, Sister Anne. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>